if you are in the US like Deborah. So uh, welcome to the next talk in this session. Uh, we've had three wonderful speakers and now we have the fourth one today. Uh, Sino uh, is probably known to a lot of people in the audience, but maybe there are some people who don't know him like students. Uh, Sino is um, a pollination biologist and he also works on conservation and uh, he's also a systematist. Uh, he works extensively on plant pollinator interactions. Uh, Sino is currently an associate professor in the Central University of Kerala. And prior to this, he did his PhD from the University of Calicut and then he did two postdocs, one of which was in Arizona with Judith Bernstein. And uh, Sino and his group, he has a well-established group and they work on plant pollinator interactions. They look at, um, uh, uh, they, they do experiments and field work to test very, very uh, interesting hypotheses. They have, uh, you know, recently they have published something on nectar robbing, which is very interesting. And uh, so he's a very active researcher in, uh, you know, in this field and probably one of the foremost pollination biologists in India. And today we are going to, uh, we requested him for a talk and he decided to speak on his pet subjects, which is the leaf cutting bees. And let's, uh, without taking up too much of his time, I will invite uh, Sinu to deliver his talk. And also for the audience, I might, uh, there's a little change for those of you who have been in the earlier sessions. Uh, this time we will take talks, uh, Sino prefers to take talks at the end of the talk. So please type your questions into the chat box if you are on live size or if you are watching this over uh, YouTube. And we will, uh, you know, uh, take your questions to Sino at the end of his lecture. So Sino, over to you. Thank you, Hema, uh, for a nice introduction. Let me try to share my presentation um, in case if there is any problems. Of course, so as I mentioned, this uh, play that uh, PPT, which I shared with you, okay? okay? Yes. Yes, we'll do that, yeah. Can you see now? Yes, we can, yeah. Go ahead. Very good. Thank you. I yeah. hope it will it will be smooth as it is. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about um, the role of leaves in pollinator conservation. As you all know, this is a very awkward title. What is the role of leaves uh, on pollinator conservation? But of course, there is a group of insects or the bees which are relying on this leaf for not for foraging but on but for uh, lining the brood cells. Uh, um, uh, which are nothing but the leaf cutter base. So before I start my presentation, I, I want to just tell a few words about Professor Shivana, who is uh, an alma mater for me, who brought me to the field of um, uh, plant pollinator interaction. Uh, I, I, when I was uh, stumbled after my PhD, where to next, uh, Professor Shivana invited me to his uh, group um, you know, for pollination biology uh, work. He is a good reproductive biologist. I joined him as an entomologist. Our um, you know, sink or our collaboration really turned out to be very fruitful. So um, uh, he, uh, he worked on the plant aspects. I worked on the insects aspects or the pollinators aspects. So this is one of the pictures we shot from Mangan where this uh, um, uh, this earthquake happened some years back. Uh, before I start my presentation, let me also acknowledge uh, and also share uh, the team members who were uh, working behind this project. In fact, this project initiated very accidentally when my daughter who is on the left-hand side with a writing board. She complained that uh, her leaves, uh, particularly the rose leaves, so what you can see on the bottom, uh, were uh, eaten away by some bees. She said some insects are carrying her leaves of the rose leaves. So then I went ahead and to see what is really going on. Until then, I was not really exposed to this uh, behavior of this uh, leaf cutter bees. So uh, Onima helped me to come up with a very nice project on leaf cutter bee plant interaction. 
And that is the time uh, Sneha, who is the next to in the bottom um, um, row, uh, she joined me as a summer research fellow uh, with, along with Aishwarya. I don't have her picture here um, from Aisar Mohali. So I, I gave a pioneer project to both of them just to inquire what are the plants this leaf cutter bees are uh, going to and uh, um, for the foraging the leaves, not for the flowers. Um, so uh, along with uh, uh, these two guys, Sangeeta, my PhD student, uh, she is the that author for nectar robbing study in Oikos, uh, joined. Then this grew up. Uh, we started uh, surveying plants in Coimbatore, Chitradurga, etc. So the team has expanded. Uh, Aneha and the Puja. Uh, joined as MSc dissertation projects that took, took care of Kerala and Manoj and Anjana uh, took care of Coimbatore and uh, uh, our Ramasubu from Gandhi Gram Rural Institute uh, helped uh, with uh, plant identification. He is a plant taxonomist. And uh, Judy Bronstein, uh, many of you may know her. Um, I had a, uh, an opportunity to work with her even for her, the leaf cutter bee was such a new project. So she invited me. As I mentioned, there are some testable hypotheses which is not yet tested, may be there. And she immediately said, yes, you must come to Arizona to work on this. So to begin with, uh, let me tell you, this uh, insects, particularly these uh, bees, are very diverse. So to begin with, they are the fantastic pollinators. Uh, because of uh, several reasons. One of the morphological reasons, uh, because they have plumosity and they have behavioral reasons. Uh, they have the flower fidelity and they go on um, to the same type of flowers stereotypically in search of food. So we call that behavior as the flower fidel. So then we call it the flower constancy of this bees. As you see, there are diverse bees I have just shown here. Uh, honey bees, there are uh, uh, halictids, there are carpenters, and leaf cutter bees, et cetera, et cetera. And they are coming. Some of them are very gentle. They come for nectar in a legitimate way, as you see the bumblebee is uh, doing on the right hand side in the bottom row. But there are bees like uh, the trigona, which is a stingless bee. She has not that long mouth part, and she always goes to the shed Lucas flowers uh, to get the remains of nectar, so she never cheats the flowers. But on the left hand side, you can see there's a blue bee, which is nothing but the amygdala. She's doing the nectar robbing. So what I mean to say with this uh, slide, you can see a diversity of uh, behavior in the bees, a diversity of uh, nature, morphologically, behaviorally in the bees. Okay, so there are 20,000 species around, that is the current knowledge, and we have around 800 species. So that is very poor when compared to the United States. So the United States has around 4,000 species. Of course, the land area is quite big. That is not the only reason. The reason is that they have a lot of arid zones and where this, this uh, soil dwelling bees, as you know that the, the behavior when bees evolved first, their primitive nature of a nesting is uh, a nesting in the soil. So when I was surveying in uh, uh, Arizona, Tucson, Southwestern United States, I had an opportunity to see some hundreds of uh, bee species in one small area like Tucson or the Flagstaff, etc. So it is not only these uh, bees are doing this job. You also see a lot of um, wasps, moths, um, flies. There are plenty. There are beetles. Uh, there are ants, and there are there are even the parasitoid wasps, which are coming to the flowers for the search of uh, food. As you all know, they don't have a very plumose hairstyle on their body. They have bristles on their body, so they have limitations to carry the pollen to the one specific flowers, and they are not really good also in terms of flower fidelity. So still, the reason literature says that these uh, known bees, so what I'm showing in this slide, which is a very complicated um, um, uh, network analysis, which recently had happened by Raider, Radar at all in 2020, if you have not come, came across, it is in the annual review of entomology, reviewed what is the role, what is the uh, service of uh, non-bees uh, to the pollination. pollination. So they have uh, 105 
uh, crop plants they surveyed they, they went through the literature and they found what you have seen in the yellow bar in that interaction network which is nothing but the bees but after the bees you can see the flies the diptera of abundant then we have coleoptera abundant etc etc so if you see this a bar plot you can see the crops are visited by different families of insects in the flies the surfeits which are nothing but the hover flies are very important so according to them along with the fao they estimated what is the value of this a non b exclusive visited crops so that they estimated that a 1.2 billion so it is not a small job so out of 105 plants there are 15 plants which received the visit exclusively of the bees there are eight crop plants which received the visits exclusively of uh, and non bees which are nothing flies but the flies wasps beetles etc there are other species 77 percentage of the species out of 105 have the visit of both the bees and the non bees so the calculated value of this surveys the pollination surveys both from the bees as well as the non bees is, is equal to 780 around 781 us dollar billion us dollars so i here comes the point uh, so as you know most of the uh, uh, temperate countries they are experiencing experiencing pollinator decline so they have a uh, uh, clear management protocols uh, uh, last uh, uh, session um, uh, um, our lucas had already exposed uh, and he is intensive agriculture and uh, crop diversification uh, you know, fellow these pictures are not nothing from uh, our temperate country they are all from kerala from my farm uh, state where i have seen the farmers are maintaining some wild wild plants we don't have the concept of forb plants by the sawn field strips whatever growing along with the crops they are normally maintain in the farm so in one farm what you see here in the bottom where you have a lot of cucurbits and amaranthus and uh, ladies uh, finger all these things uh, are growing they are deliberately maintaining a lot of lucas flowers so we are estimating what is the value of this uh, uh, non crop plants in the crop plants so the point i want to highlight here the managing pollinators so far has given most of the trust to managing the flowers managing the wild flowers and they want to uh, improve the pollination surveys by increasing the number of bees or the population size of the bees uh, or per visit uh, to the flowers etc etc what we lost in that run is managing the pollinators by increasing the nesting provisions so this picture has shown the very common bees to all of you one is the picture of um, apis dorsata which is open hive there are pictures um, uh, there is a picture of apis serrana which is a hollow uh, burrow nesting and we have the nest of this uh, carpenter bees so they all are nesting in the wild scapes but they have their own requirement for nesting say so for example the large apis dorsata need large trees with a very good branches or in the concrete places so they need balconies they need your cooperation and simultaneously the silocopa needs or the carpenter bees needs the dead plants in your system and the dead pits in your system for nesting so we have not really studied what is the impact of this nesting or how to improve the pollination surveys by improving this uh, nesting provisions what what uh, her montfiat or so alexandra in illinois so recently reviewed again in annual review of entomology she said there are only 75% of the species there are no information about where they are nesting or what they are using for nesting so basically she is a soil bee specialist and she has concerned mostly on the soil bees uh, soil dwelling uh, bees uh, and uh, she wants to model it how they are behaving etc etc so what i have depicted here again is an anthidium which is a solitary bee which is a mason bee and uh, uh, which is a nesting that is a novel other than in uh, sringeri where my field site was and you can see the helicopter there's another carpenter bee on over here in the bottom which is using a small crevice for their nesting so nothing is small for the bees everything is important the soils uh, nature the moisture level in the soil 
uh, aspect of the, the land, all these things are very important. So she reviewed and said that the solitary bees, while the solitary bees, only 25 percentage of the solitary bees has some information that's all on the nesting biology investigations by this uh, Terry Griswold or from uh, Rosen, uh, Jerome Rosen, and there are n number of uh, North American specialists dedicated themselves to study this uh, soil nesting bees. So they just, just studied the soil nesting biology, but not much on the ecology or the, from the community perspective. So the, our information on this uh, soil bees or this uh, nesting biology is uh, very poor. So before I move to what is the uh, 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 what is the highlight of this talk, let me also tell you the origin of bees is very important to know. So I don't know whether you have noticed or not, uh, there is a group of uh, um, uh, scientists said that the angiosperms evolved way before what we were estimated like uh, 135 million years. They were there, say for example, 200 million years because of the molecular dating. So along with that, there are, we need to get, we need to calibrate the evolution of the bees also. So what these pictures again shows some of my pictures, again, uh, because this may be hosted in the YouTube, I can't use uh, uh, these uh, pictures from the net. So what I'm showing here, there is a specific wasp, which is uh, carrying a cord, nothing but a caterpillar and she is uh, uh, carrying that to her soil nest. That was the primitive nature. So this, the, uh, the evolution of bees have happened or has happened from that carnivorous behavior and that is provisioning their nest by the animal matter that has been all of a sudden, not all of a sudden, but gradually has been evolved to uh, become, some of them have migrated to nest are uh, not even nesting, they are just laying their eggs, which are nothing but the parasitoid wasp, what you see on the right hand side in the bottom, you, you can see a caterpillar where there are appendage kind of things are coming out, nothing but the offsprings of this uh, parasitoid wasp. So that is a one lineage, a monophyletic lineage has happened on the parasitoid evolution. Along with that, during the evolution of uh, flowering plants, uh, this uh, bees also have been evolved. So you can see the bees uh, compared to the wasp are not taking the animal matter. They are going to the flowers for the nectar as well as the pollen grains. So they have developed a lot of um, body hairs on their body for carrying or grooming these pollen grains uh, and to uh, carry that to the nest. So what has already happened that to permit your character is still retained by some of the ancestral bees. That is nothing but nesting in the in the soil. So, but if you if you look at uh, uh, the evolution and diversification of bees, they have migrated from that, or they have just uh, evolved to use so many other materials or resources available in the system for nesting. So, how these twenty thousand species are arranged in the tree, you can see there are long-term bees, which are nothing but megachylids, as well as the pits, and we have the short-term bees, which are nothing but antrinates, haliptids, and uh, stenotribids, and the qualitids, etc. Few of them are very diverse for India. Some of them, like stenotribidae, we don't have here, uh, which are Australian-specific, etc. So, this is how these bees are seen on the phylogenetic tree. So, uh, now I'm moving to this uh, leaf cutter bees. Uh, let me tell you the bees, whether we noticed or whether we really appreciated or not, they're all herbivores. What they're feeding, they are feeding, they are foraging on the pollen grains, they're foraging on the nectar. So if we are saying that there's a really good example of mutualism, not exactly, then, then it's, it's also showing both of them have their own interests. Plant has interest and they have this uh, uh, um, uh, traits evolved for making use of the bees and the bees have the traits which evolved to make use of the flowers and make use of the traits to uh, get the pollen, get the nectar, etc., etc. So what is shown on the right hand side, there is a carpenter bee again, uh, um, is uh, ne ne getting nectar by cheating the flowers or with nothing but this uh, uh, robbing the flowers. So, this uh, 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 diversity in their behavior, in their nesting, in their foraging, you can see everywhere. 
in in the in the case of bees so but there are some bees which are purely herbivore or there are uh, they are showing the behavior exactly like um, a very generalist herbivorous insect like a caterpillar or like a, uh, um, a larvae or like a beetle like a leaf beetle um, like uh, many other things um, um, uh, with, uh, many herbivorous insects nothing but they are harvesting the leaf what you can see here there is a rose flower rose plant you can see in the exactly in the center there is a bee attempting to make um, 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 uh, it, this um, a leaf cut uh, for um, lining their brood cells so this is a, this is a very curious so we were we were curious to ask why they are doing that and what for whether they have some uh, preference etc etc so um uh, sometimes in 2012 from the danforth lab brian danforth in cornell university um um uh, litman uh, one of maybe her, his phd student uh, has studied this diversification of megachylidae the whole uh, family megachylidae and they have molecular they calibrated their uh, evolution with uh, molecular dating and they find that the megachylids which you can see the bottom branching one which is nothing but the blue color which has evolved the 22 million years ago that means among the whole some uh, solid uh, i mean the megachylid bees uh, the leaf cutter bees or the behavior of the cutting leaves uh, is evolved very recently so compared to the resin bees or mason bees or what you see which have been evolved very Uh, early so you can see that is that has happened when the gondwan and movement or the splitting has happened that uh, uh, bees started uh, um, using the dead dead tree trunk some of them started harvesting the resins from the plants some of them started using the snail some of them started use a lining that resin with uh, on the mud using the mud to uh, line the nest and the very later this leaf cutter bee started coming and just started using this leaf to line the nest so this shows how this nest appears so we have a tunnel and there is a provision there is a larvae kept or egg is kept and the egg will be making use of this so what is leaf cutter bee leaf cut oh is it uh kema it seems it has gone the connection has gone hema hello uh, hema hello. can you see yes we can see oh okay yes. yeah, yeah yeah all right great because my wife alerted said that it has gone i'm sorry no, no. <laughs> no, we, we we still have you we are on this uh, slide with the mega uh mega kyl me okay, leaf cutter bee right right great so yeah. who is leaf cutter bee a leaf cutter bee is belong to the genus mega kyl so it is one of the largest bee genera around 1500 species around the world it's cosmopolitan you can see everywhere except antarctica probably important pollinators particularly of the fabaceae plants uh, they have an affinity towards the fabaceae flowers and the mega kyl rotundata is uh, one of the uh, uh, heavily used cosmo uh, um, commercially um, uh, um, uh, exploited species uh, where this north american people are using this as a pollinator of alfalfa as well as the clovers so um, cane slab again uh, pitsinger and the cane there is a fantastic review again in 2011 or 12 um they have reviewed exclusively on this uh, uh, mega kyl rotundata um what is it and uh, how to manage it uh, how they were successful in uh, uh, coming up with uh, artificial nesting how to commercially use it etc so let me also tell this mega kyl has unlike other bees have a scopal apparatus on the ventral side of the gaster you can see in this bee you can see a golden color which is a golden color bristles um, um, uh, uh, on the ventrum or this uh, gaster that is the place where they are um, carrying the pollen grains so the flowers of the fabaceae in plants also have their reproductive parts on the lower keels so they have a tight co evolution might have occurred between the fabaceae flowers as well as uh, this megachylid bees 
So what they are up to? So they are basically going to the uh, plants and uh, cut the leaf fragments so from the very fresh leaf, very young leaf. Uh, so they don't go to the old leaf for the reason. Um, they first, I believe, uh, they can't really cut it. There is um, again a, a recent paper from Engel. Engel's group. Um, um, they have studied the blade, the mandibular blade structure, and their affinity. Um, uh, their their uh, success of cutting leaves and all. There is a journal of Melitology paper um, um, reviewed the whole taxonomy of this uh, mega tail and uh, how this behavior has been evolved. So, but it still keep on going. This evolution and the stories are still keep on getting updated. So, uh, basically, they go to the very young leaf, but not very tender leaf. Once it's just a lignification or uh, just getting um, uh, uh, you know uh, rigid. They go to that kind of leaf and uh, harvest them and they carry them, uh, carrying in their mandibles and uh, between the legs and they carry that to the nest. So what they do, they transport leaf disc and they construct a bow ground nest. But there are some bees uh, in Arizona I have seen, which are still nesting in the ground. Uh, the reason may be Arizona is such a hot desert the soil humidity is a very low, the microbial infection or this uh, mold encroachment to the provision may be very low. So I have seen these bees are still using, some of them, I have seen, most of them are using artificial materials like uh, metal tubes, uh, um, the, the concrete structures, the et cetera, et cetera, uh, and even the pith of the wood and some palms, et cetera. But there are some bees are still using the soil. But in tropics, you can't see that uh, behavior because of its uh, uh, moisture level of the soil is uh, pretty high. So there may be the brood uh, uh, survival is uh, pretty low. So there is a reason why they are going to the um, uh, above soil because they don't have the duffers plant secretions or the mandibular secretions, which are the ones basically the bees they use to line their brood cells. Uh, uh, which is the purpose of that is to um, stop the mold encroach, mold encroachment, the fungal encroachment into the uh, pollen as well as the blended pollen nectar uh, food and uh, even to protect the uh, brood from the parasites and parasitoids, etc. So unfortunately, these uh, bees do not have that trait at all. So there is a one group of people believe that these leaves, or even I believe that the leaves of what these bees are carrying have this antimicrobial probability or the pro pro uh, um, uh, 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 traits. Uh, that may be the reason the bees are really using this uh, leaf, but the, that need, again need to be tested and the, the work is uh, going on in my lab. So uh, this is how the bees nest look like, you can see they are uh, stacking the leaf and uh, you curl the leaf uh, and um, they use like 30, 40 leaves of oblong size. Some of them are very circular, tiny leaves, which are they're using uh, uh, to see let the tips of this, uh, um, this each of this uh, brood cell. And you can see this uh, larvae is uh, feeding. So here are some pictures uh, from my lab where we have excavated this or explored this uh, nesting behavior of these bees and which was not very uh, uh, sophisticated places. Some of them were nesting even in my son's cycle because he was not here. He was not using it uh, for a month or so in last May. Uh, during the vacation, I have seen this uh, bees carrying the leaves and it is a uh, nesting. It is uh, uh, piling up actually. In this, uh, I can see three such uh, uh, brood, broods um, and it is keep on going. It's based on what is the length of this uh, uh, tube, hollow material, it, uh, uh, it, it stacks one after another. So you can see these bees are coming out from this. You can see the diversity of uh, shapes of the leaves, uh, leaf fragments they used to make one brood cell. And this is just one example to show how this uh, nest look like, a nesting place look like in the wild scape in the wild escape, but in the forest, it may be different places like uh, pits of all the trees, etc. But in um, um, in uh, anthropos and anthropogenic places, certainly they are exploring all the hollow material available um, in, in their surrounding. 
All right, along with uh, uh, when we started our work, before we could publish the, the uh, preference of the bees, uh, Scott Lab in, uh, 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 in Packer's Lab, actually uh, uh, in Canada, uh, Scott McEvoy, a PhD student, uh, published uh, the leaf resources of the bees in Toronto are using. So what he has done, he published that in 2016, almost in the same time, and he found that there are 54 plant species, uh, three species of leaf cutter bees are uh, using in Toronto, and uh, how did they approach? They, they have installed several trap nests in the cities, um, around 200 meter in Toronto city, and they collected the leaf fragments from uh, this uh, nest, and they, uh, because it's very difficult to identify this uh, leaf fragment, uh, even an expert taxonomist, a plant taxonomist, it's very difficult to identify down to the family, even to the family, it is very tough for the identification of plants. Uh, so what did they do? They extracted the DNA and they sequenced and they blasted in the gene bank. Uh, they could not get uh, data for all the leaf fragments, but for quite a number of uh, plants, they got uh, a similarity and they came up uh, with the uh, uh, with, with, uh, conclusion that the bees are using 54 plant species in the Toronto. So this is from their paper and they have shown the bees uh, preference. So they have shown three different symbols. What megakyla rotundata is using, what is uh, fostered there is a phylogenetic diversity of the plant species uh, which are used by these particular bees. You can see this is an invasive bee, the megakyla rotundata, basically it's a European and they brought it in North America and they are giving a very major uh, pressure to the native megakyle bees and they find that their use of plants are overnumbering or outnumbering uh, over the other two species of uh, megakyle bees. So then that within several months, uh, within not very uh, big gap, we could publish our work from our small locality in Kanyangar in Kasargod part of Kerala. Uh, uh, this uh, guys and the Sneha Kambli uh, she was the summer fellow and Aishirya. We could publish our paper on the leaf foraging sources of uh, leaf cutter bees. And uh, we also found that 59 species of uh, plants are being used by these uh, leaf cutter bees uh, in a small place like um, Kaninga. It has around uh, um, 10 by 10 um, kilometers per municipality. So it's, it's a municipality limit to be explored, but not extensively. We had around the 15 plots, and in each 15 plot, we had four subplots, and we had like 50 by 50 meter plots, and we studied what are the uh, plants. Unfortunately, in that time, we, because of enthusiasm, we did not really look at what are the plants the bees did not use, so we could not really tell the preference of the bees with this study. So, but we could see they are using the leaves of golden shower. You can see there is a nest we could find from a PVC um, uh, pipe, uh, electric supply uh, pipe, and we could see the leaf is being cut from a very small uh, leaf like this. Um, and you can even see from the uh, leaves of uh, uh, Laurasian plants, which are the primitive in nature, uh, polyalpia species, etc., and the bilimbi that is. Um, Aburia bilimbi, which is nothing but our, um, um, uh, um, I, I, I don't know the common name, so, but it's a very common um, uh, plant in Kerala. So we could see an, a good number of uh, plants have been used by this uh, leaf cutter bees uh, to harvest the leaf. So, but what we could find, uh, what we did in that experiment, we collected the leaf and we measured the length of the leaf and the length of the cutting on that leaf, the width of the leaf and the width of the cutting of the leaf. And we find that there is a not such a positive relationship. It says that the leaf um, the size is not a predictor at all to, uh, uh, to cut a, a certain size to be certain size to leaf fragment. But what we see a good relationship between the length of the leaf and the width of the leaf with the number of cuts on the leaf. So if there is a leaf which, is, uh, which has a cut, the bees will be coming back to that leaf again and making more cuts and 
using them um, to, to the extent possible. So you can see a good number of cuts on a very large leaf. So, but they are also going to the very small leaf. Sometimes they collect the whole leaf too. So the list what we came up, there may be a 95 or 99 percentage accuracy. One percentage of a tiny leaves may be used um, whole, as you had seen with uh, the previous in the previous slide. Um, the nest you can see they have used the whole leaf of very tiny leaves. So that took me to uh, Southwest US with the Raman Fellowship. Um, I the behavior of this leaf cutter bees uh, in, in a place where they're supposed to evolve, not exactly the place where they evolve, a condition, a environment where these bees have really evolved, which is nothing but an arid and a xeric climate. That is the place where this uh, leaf cutter bees have started evolved, have been evolved. So Judy Bronstein uh, 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 was so uh, uh, enthusiastic because so far in her lab, such a study never happened. So now there is a third student working after my uh, postdoc over there um, on various aspects of this leaf cutter bee. So we are still uh, collaborating. So you can see the landscape of Southwest Sonoran Desert is something like this very few broadleaf to plant. So you can see a lot of mesquites, which are nothing but the narrow leaf, or there are a lot of uh, needle-like of leaf, and a lot of uh, mm, um, this uh, cactus, and, uh, uh, but there are few broadleaf to plant, which may be very hard in nature. So I really want to see what kind of leaf they're really using, or how far they are traveling to collect uh, a good leaf for ne making nest, etc., etc. So, what we studied over there, so our Arizona desert chapter, uh, uh, we could not see many uh, nests over there. We could not collect a lot of uh, uh, bee nests, but the arboretum where we studied, that was another site, the University of Arizona Arboretum, the campus, which is about four kilometers square, expanded in the heart of uh, Tucson. They have a wonderful arboretum. They identified each plant species with its name, where from they, are, they brought in, uh, when they planted, um, uh, who identified, and whether they are applying pesticides on the foliages. Uh, so all this information on that black label uh, is given, not all like pesticide and all. I have went to this uh, um, uh, arboretum specialist and uh, uh, the people concerned, to find out uh, what kind of pesticides they're applying, et cetera, because I want to know whether they are exposed to these uh, pesticides, et cetera, and all. So what we looked at, uh, what is, so in nutshell, I have exposure to a good system where every plant is identified. Uh, I know when, what is origin, where from the plant is abroad. So I can even study whether the bee cut bee, native bees have uh, specificity to native plants uh, or they don't mind. So what we inquired, we collected the information of the plant, we studied what is the phylogenetic relationship of that uh, uh, plant, so whether their plants are closely related or not. We studied what the leaf look like, whether they are large leaf, whether, whether the leaves are always elliptical or oval in shape, or there are leaves which are um, uh, like you see in the right hand side, um, a different shape, leaf, etc. And we studied what are the predictive traits at the species level, whether bees have an affinity to the plant habit, like uh, herbs, shrubs, trees, etc., or from uh, um, the nativity of the plants. We studied the predictive traits within the plant level, like how the leaf look like, what is the um, uh, leaf uh, size, what is the leaf shape, what is the toughness of the leaf, what is the water content of the leaf, all this information. So this is a picture of the University of Arizona. Um, uh, you can see this uh, map very closely. You can see the arboretum. If you go and click on that map each and every uh, green plant, you will be getting that information on your finger tip. tip. So wherever I could not get such information, I went to George Ferguson, who is the botanist in the arboretum, and he identified that plant. Sometimes there are weeds coming. So what we have the information from the arboretum, there are 209 plant species, 
5,000, around 6,000 plant individuals I surveyed. I may be the only person in the University of Arizona traveled every corner of the campus. I may be, other than uh, this uh, cleaning staff and arboretum specialists, and no student might have reached. I was even took by the security because I was peeping uh, to each and every corner. So, but I have I have information about where the plants, how they are looking live, whether there is any clumpness of the plant, etc. So I surveyed each and every plant in the campus for two seasons because the year I joined, it was uh, summer. The next year when I was uh, leaving, again, there was an extra flush of the leaf. So uh, we could not identify all the bee species, but uh, we could get information for three species, gentilis and the Texana and uh, uh, Rotundata. So uh, what we looked at, uh, we studied uh, plant species, the uh, growth form, abundance of the plant and to know whether abundance is a reason why bees are preferring certain plant species. Region of origin, we could get that information from the authorities so we can even correlate it with that. So luckily, in the year when I joined uh, for this work, I'm just from phylogenetic group have published their um, uh, seminal work on uh, the revised. Every 10 years, they are revising the phylogeny of phylogeny of angiosperms. So I could get the very updated angiosperm phylogeny tree to see where my plants are really located in, in the phylogeny tree. So I used that information to map the leaf cutter bees, the preferred plants over there. So here is a George Ferguson who was there to my, every of my uh, clarification who helped me to identify what those plant, plant, plants are. All right. So here there is a picture you can see in the upper panel, there are some failed attempts of these bees start, started in a cutting, but they stopped at the midrib level. That says that the bees are stopping the cutting the leaf, uh, perhaps because that is difficult to manage by the uh, mandibles. So the mandibles may not be that sharp enough to cut through that. Um, so you can even see that leaf, uh, uh, the one which are closer but towards the apical region, you can see they are nicely cutting only from one half of that uh, leaf, the other half they are coming back later. So the midrib is uh, one of the limiting factors. The bee is uh, uh, affected uh, by uh, uh, for cutting the leaf. So simultaneously, we can see a lot of citrus and citronella. Uh, it's a heaven in um, uh, Arizona, you can see ornamental oranges plenty. So I could not see even a single cut on these orange leaves. Um, uh, there were like around uh, uh, 400, 600 plants, uh, I, I can't remember, but there are some avenues where there is only citrus and citronella plants, uh, but there are not even a single cut on any of the young leaf uh, in both the years. So, so even though the leaves are very tender, the, the midrib is uh, not very hard, they could not, uh, they could not use that leaf. So we studied all these aspects on leaf dimensions, length, breadth. My wife really helped, but as you know, it's a very difficult, it's a costly job to get in a manpower there to do all this exercise of measuring. My wife and daughter helped me in that way. Uh, so they, they, they dried the leaf, they, they dried and they weighed the leaf to find out the water content. What is the length of the leaf? This is the panel you can see they have drawn, there's a one centimeter square uh, writing pad to find out what is uh, the leaf area, the leaf cutter bees really used, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, my wife Nidu, 3,800 leaves I brought in and 6,000 plus cuts were there. And she measured the length, the breadth, uh, width, as well as um, the area using that, uh, uh, that uh, writing board of 130 plant species. So we could not really use this that we are still working on the size of the leaf, etc. So that came up with a very good paper encouraging preferences. Actually, this paper is a not exclusively for the uh, Arizona plant, but for three regions because it's a nice time. I didn't have a much, much teaching job. Um, I had only her research time. So I went to each and every literature published on the nesting biology of this leaf cutting bees. And I found what plant they really used. So we came up with around 258 plant species so far 
reported uh, from around the world, uh, and this is that paper. So, but the Arizona paper is still uh, under preparation. So, this is how the global map of this um, angiosperm phylogeny uh, tree uh, plants, uh, angiosperm phylogeny tree looks like. Um, uh, this is what I brought in uh, from uh, the APG4 uh, group literature in botanical. Uh, uh, I mean, this uh, Botanical Journal of Linnean Society where they published in 2016. But what I used, I found the you know, affinity uh, or not definitely the membership of each and every species to the orders of this uh, uh, plant, like laurels, um, like the pabels, like the raw cells, et cetera, et cetera. So I find um, the global literature, you can see there are 47 percent, which you can see on the right hand side box. What I've shown, what is the global flora look like? There are 47 percent of the entire world have uh, you know, asteroid, asteroids, asteroid plants, um, lilies, etc. And we have only 28 percent of the plants which are uh, raw seeds, so where these fabels uh, are coming. And we have 25 percent of the plants. Uh, we have the mesangiosperms, uh, monocots, and the primitive groups of the plants, uh, uh, which are very close to um, the gymnosperms uh, are seen. So, but you can see the globally, the 71 percentage of the plants, uh, the leafcutter bees are used uh, belonging to these uh, rosid plants. Only 25 percentage of the records uh, uh, from the nesting biology, uh, the bees are using astrid, astrid plants. Again, if you look at closely on this orange balls, very close to this tree, you can see 45 percentage of that plants coming from a very small cluster of fabels, or raw cells, or fagels, or cucurbitales. So that's again a phylogenetically closer group of plants. So 45 percentage of the 71 percent of the plants are coming from very close group of related species. So that says that there is something um, similar among those plants, uh, uh, why the bees are using that particular plant for uh, nesting. So here comes the literature from the uh, arboretum. We did not see that kind of uh, relationship over there because this is a locality specific study where we have seen seven percentage of the total flora belong to the mesangiosperms monocots, but six percentage of that plants are used but 62% uh, of the plants were rosted, 72% of the plants uh, are used. Uh, we have 31% of the plants as traits, and 22% of that are used. But what again is striking over there is not on the higher tax of the plant, but on the lower tax uh, of this uh, orders of the plant. Again, the globally, what you are seeing is uh, consistently seen over here. There is a 42 percentage of uh, plants which these bees used belong to the small cluster of fabels, raw cells, fagels, etc. So that says that uh, yes, the abundance may be a predictor, but it is not a predictor. We ran this a model. We did not find a good relationship with abundance. But this is the species. This is the number of species. But in the next slide, what we have shown. How many how many plants there um, belong to each of these uh, clades? Excuse me, let me just take some water. There is no break. Okay, so uh, th this is a striking story. Here, what we see the, in the arboretum, around 2,500 plants, each belong to raw seed and astrid. Out of this, uh, to 2,523 uh, 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 plants, 96% of the raw seeds had cut. Uh, I mean, the plant stems, the individuals. It's not the species. The individual stems, the every uh, 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 96 uh, plant out of 100 had cut in the, in, uh, in the raw seed cluster. Uh, every 68 plant in the 100 belong to the astrids I had a cut in the um, uh, plant. So let's say that we, we find that there is a, a heavy uh, preference to the raw seed plants uh, over these astrid plants in terms of the individuals, in terms of individual. But again, striking over there, there were 40 species of fabies in plant in the algorithm. 
38 were used. 38 of the 40 species were used heavily. It's not even one, not one cut. There are plenty of cuts on um, uh, those leaves. So 95 percentage of them are really used. Okay, so it comes to uh, whether the bees have any preference to the nativity of uh, plants from their coming. Lucky to see so many Indian plants that they brought there, including our cassia, fistula, uh, Adathoda vasaka, um, um, uh, uh, Desmodium gangeticus, um, so many such plants. So they are even coming from a very far away place. So their native of origin is a very far, very distant, uh, but you can see them also used. See, Afrotropics, so what is shown on the orange bars? are the number of plants available, number of species available from each region. The corresponding number of uh, plants are used. Australia, there are so many of them, about 10 species, about, uh, nearly 10 species are used, but into Malayan, there are species coming from Malaysia, Singapore, etc. There are a good number of them used. Paleotic region, and a very good number of plants from China, Japan, are uh, there in the arboretum, a good number of them are used. The native plants are what you see in the Neartic, Neartic bar also have been used in that. So we don't find any uh, preference uh, on the plants based on the nativity of the plants. So what are the drivers? If we ran the models and we find leaf habit, the non-glabrous plant, the less preferred, that means uh, the plants should be glabrous. The non-glabrous include all the nomenclature, like the hirsute, the scabros, uh, um, uh, or matty, whatever. You know, there are trichomes available, wax available, or there are um, uh, um, hairs available. These, are they're less likely they are used. So the glabrous leaves, very smooth surface leaves are used. Water content, if the, the plants of the leaves are very rich in water, they may not be used. Clade, there is a positive relationship here based on the uh, alphabetical name the model prefers, so the rosette comes later, so the rosette plants have been used uh, preferably. Abundance, uh, no preference because of negative value, see, there's a negative interaction seen, but it is not really significant, but uh, abundance is not really a criteria for the bees to use um, uh, um, uh, 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 the, or prefer a plant. So leaves chosen, they're always a newly flush, no old leaf. No latex producing or resin producing leaf never used. So what about the leaf size and shape? We have seen the different size leaf. We have used only the broad, broad leaf plant. We never used the leaves of this acacia or this mesquite, etc., because they are very tiny, so they may not be used by the bees at all. So we have used the broad leaf. What we see a diversity of this leaf. You can see the leaves of um, solanum annum, uh, what do you see in the left hand side panel on the right hand side column? You can see the leaves of uh, some African plant which is on the first column, the topmost one, or cassia fistula flower, that is the longest flower available in the garden, that is used to the mimosa distachia, it's a native plant, to the neotic neo region, it has a very tiny leaf, even that is used. The shape, there is a no such a relationship. Is a oblong leaf, elliptical leaf, um, whatever shape, there is no problem. Palmate leaf, they're all being used by this leaf cutter base. So that says that there is, a, that's also not a criteria for a bee to use them. What this again shows, and it's consistent to our uh, uh, Indian study, we find that area of average cut, the cut area increasing positively with the leaf area. So if there are with broad leaf to plant, yes, there is a great chance they are using, they are cutting a very large fragment from the leaf area and the number of cuts, again, there is a positive relationship. So that says that uh, once a bee cut a leaf, uh, it never find that leaf uh, bad, or it never find the leaf uh, not uh, uh, usable, unlike uh, other uh, other herbivores. So the herbivores, uh, once you find uh, a bee, a leaf already has uh, damage, they never prefer to even lay the eggs. You can see them in the butterflies and the moths. So, but in this case, the bee comes back, there may be a positive feedback, the, the bee is getting, and it comes back to the same leaf to um, harvest the leaf. So what we know so far, leaf cutter bees have marked the preference for the plants, for leaf, whose leaf they cut, predictable primarily by the plant clade. 
if not by the higher order or not by the higher tax but by the lower tax like the order level like the fabings predictable uh, secondarily by the leaf parameters uh, they prefer the uh, glossy leaves species from bees home region are not at all uh, a criterion for the bee to use so results are consistent uh, with the global surveys although the information is uh, very scanty at that time but now after our study well, they stimulated many to take up take up such studies including our own study i'm not showing our uh, further indian literature because they have no, never published and because this is going to be posted in the net what we don't know this is what we are now working um, can we apply this hypothesis relevant to herbivores to the leaf cutter bees the thing is the herbivore is a different group of animals where they eat the leaf but the leaf cutter bees they are not eating but what i find there is a, some kind of uh, similarity in the way they are uh, using the leaf the way they prefer the leaf whether such kind of uh, uh, hypothesis existing between the leaf cutter bees and uh, plants and we are testing some of those hypotheses why are some plant species in the right higher tax like the oranges like the citrus why they are have been avoided so what are the reason whether there is any um, chemical interaction happening so we are studying that why are some individual plants in the right species are not used so that is like this oranges what are some individual leaves on right plant individuals not used uh, all the judy comes up with this hypothesis i never because i was doing the field i find this is totally depending on number of or the space available for the nesting number of bees in the system so if you go and see there are plenty of their uh, host plants but if they don't have good resources pollen or nectar they may not be approaching all the leaf but judy is still doing that hypothesis why they are really doing so i am doing that indian part over here why the bees are using to certain leaves why they are not going to other leaves etc so there are so many testable hypotheses now came up and we are working on that bees never used these oranges never used any of the morasian plants so as you know morasians have resin uh bees never used one of the fabius in plant to remember 38 out of 40 species uh, were uh, uh, used and the two species which are one of them is uh, pisidia mollis uh, which is again a neotropical plant people the tri tribal people use this plant they make the they, call, they, they make the um, um, uh, aqueous extract of this to for fishing so that is why it is called fish poison so they we get that aqueous extract and they dump in the pond all the fishes will be floating because um, because of asphyxia or some kind of uh, poison available rotting on in seen in that leaf so again this is an interesting topic whether this leaf a uh, cutter bee or identifying certain plants based on their toxicity even though they belong to a group of uh, plants which are mm, uh, which are uh, in the right taxa you can see here the bees are returning back you can see the bohemia they are coming back to the same leaf although there are so many other leaves which are really eligible for cutting or qualified for cutting you can see the bees are really coming back to their leaf um, the one which are used the why so and explanation for this the leaf physical properties we already solved that or we already find the relationship chemical properties we are working on this but this the chemical interaction happening antimicrobial properties in the leaf whether the leaves which are used by the bees are having similar properties in the respect of their taxonomic membership or not all right here it comes what are the threats and conservation the leaf cutter bees are facing one major threat is um, um, is uh, uh, the pesticide application and also the of this uh, um, uh, the perception from the ornamental plant industry because they find although the literature is not plenty uh, uh, there are some studies of, uh, from uh, north america um, some horticultural institutes that came up with uh, uh, advice grace uh, um, uh, to manage the leaf cutter bees but luckily but not by the pesticide again something which we are working with the bees have some problem with the pesticide application or not some laboratory studies are happening here 
So a uh, major threat is coming from uh, you know, this ornamental industry because majority of the plants, these leaf cutter bees in the anthropogenic places are uh, using the ornamental plants like uh, um, um, rose, bougainvillea, bohemia, etc., etc. So what we need to do for the conservation, we need both the leaf foraging plants for leaf cutter bees. For other bees, you need only the floral resources then the soil, then the other the stratum available uh, for, uh, required for the nesting. But you need here the leaves as well as the flowers. So for example, the golden golden shower is a very good uh, uh, foraging plant uh, for the leaf cutter bees, both for the leaf and the, uh, uh, the flowers. In the Arizona, as well as in the southwestern place, uh, barrel cactus, so, so many cactus, other species, there are around 58 species of cactus that are recorded, are all used heavily by these leaf cutter bees. So they are the heavens. They are the major um, oasis for these leaf cutter bees to produce good now amount of nectar. They are uh, diving into these uh, flowers and get the nectar as well as the pollen. So we need to plant the, both these uh, leaf uh, foraging plants and the flower foraging plant. My request to all of you, you know, to plant at least one rose. We are all maintaining rose. But if, they are, if you are seeing herbivory, please don't uh, mind because you are conserving a beneficial uh, pollinator over there. So what are the other threats? We don't have enough nesting places. Of course, this is understudied. So this, uh, this is what we need to now uh, prioritize. What is the nesting habit? How the environment looking like? What kind of threats they are facing? People are advising this trap nest as a good, upper, good uh, method to maintain the leaf cutter bees in the arable lands. But let me tell you, this, is, this may lead to the disaster because as you know, resource concentration hypothesis, if you go, this is applicable even to the leaf cutter bees. What you're doing, you are bringing a place where the leaf cutter bees are heavily using, it is a heaven for the natural enemies uh, like the parasitoids. Uh, Belvadi's lab already studied this and they came up with a, a nice paper, although that is not an extensive study, but it's a very wonderful observation. I find 86% of the brood they uh, surveyed in GKVK in Bangalore um, have been lost to this uh, uh, um, braconids, not braconids, a eulophid parasitoids. So let me tell you, we need to maintain their wild scale. This bringing this kind of trap nest. Now there is a growing amount of literature saying that uh, may not be a viable solution. Trap nest is uh, not a viable way to ma manage this leaf cutter bees in our surroundings. So what we are launching now, so luckily we got a project and some Indian collaborators, uh, Smita is there and uh, Jodi is there and Hema herself is there and my whole team in Ecology Lab, and I look forward to collaborate to anybody uh, from any part of the world on uh, this project. Um, so hope the money may be coming. There is a sanction letter, but uh, I don't. I hope the COVID will not take that money uh, for <laughs> other reasons. Uh, so we are going to study this. Uh, uh, Dr. Belvadi is also a consultant in the project. He could not join uh, officially because he is uh, retired now. We are working on taxonomy, phylogeny, and the conservation of these leaf cutter bees in India. Hope this will come true. So let me thank you for your patient descent, uh, listening, and I'm so happy to take up any questions uh, if you have. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear. Yeah. So we have a raised hand, uh, Bellabadi. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah. One of the questions that I wanted to ask is, you know that pigeon pea is uh, almost exclusively pollinated by leaf cutter bees, mega Yes, yes. And uh, supposing if we do something to increase the leaf cutter bee populations, by, as you said, maybe by increasing the nesting sites or whatever. I think within the pigeon pea pop, uh, plots, we also should think of uh, planting the leaf resources, right? Yes. yes. Identify first what are the leaves that they are harvesting, that they are taking, and then, uh, because I think you also mentioned that they do not take the Fabaceae leaves, right? 
No, they they do they do take. I they see. do okay. take. So mm -hmm. I, I I wish to visit. We don't have the pigeon pea in, in Kerala. Yeah. It's not a crop for yeah. us. I wish yeah. to really see. Uh, uh, you know, maybe I would recommend you one to you. Go and see. Maybe they are using the pigeon pea uh, really? leaves yeah. leaves for harvesting. Uh, and make lining their yeah, I think I think uh, Viresh Kumar has uh, raised his hand. I think he has worked on that and he should be able to add uh, yeah. information. Yeah, thank you. Then I have another question. Uh, yeah. Sino. Can we, can we, uh, uh, can we wait? Uh, can we take the question from Viresh Kumar? Okay, yeah. Hello? Yeah, yeah, Viresh. Go ahead. Yes. Ah, see, sir. It's yeah, an excellent Viresh. presentation. Uh, this you. is just uh, for the information. I want to add to your presentation. Uh, you told uh, soil nesting megacolids you recorded in uh, Arizona, uh, uh -huh. but not in the subtropical, right? Uh, but uh, yeah, tropical uh, region. Uh, we have also recorded uh, soil nesting megacolids in and around uh, Bangalore also. Uh, because not all megacolids are, uh, uh, even not all megacolids cut the leaves because of their mandibles. Uh, they don't have cutting edges to cut the leaves. Uh, for that, there are so many species um, are using soil uh, nests instead of going for uh, leaf cut. And uh, with respect to the Fabaceae, I, I have also yeah. observed that so many species of plants utilized by the leaf cutter which doing uh, during our study period. Yeah, thank great. You. Yeah. yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah, and again, the Bangalore and uh, the Plateau uh, is a dry zone compared to Kerala and the western part of uh, uh, Western yes. Guards. We have yes. the humid zone yes. here. Uh, I yes. think uh -huh. that climate, the environment over there may be like uh, Arizona climate. Arizona, you know that it is. Um, very dry. So the places like Belsima, Chitradurga, and all those places uh, may be a good good site where the leaf cutter is still using. May, as you said, yeah. may not be leaf cutting. Maybe they are using the mud for uh, yes, nesting. Yes, correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Virish. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Belavadi, do you, I, I'm sorry I interrupted you. I thought someone uh, else was okay. interrupting uh, Yeah. I just wanted to note, uh, you know, did you measure the thickness of the leaves? Uh, we did not really measure the thickness of the leaf uh, in that study. What we have seen, only the water content in the leaf by just okay. uh, finding the difference. So we didn't have a penetrometer at that time. So we just went yeah. with yeah. only uh, the water content. Yeah. Kavya has a question. Kavya? Yeah. Yeah. Why they are going for what? Uh, not uh, Kavya, it's not all leaves. Uh, perfect circles. As you saw in one of the slides, most of the leaves they use are oblong. It's elliptical or oblong in, in size. Um, uh, mo the, the walls of the nest or the walls of their brood chamber, um, uh, uh, they need a long leaf. And only in the typical region on the endings, they use the very tiny uh, leaf. Uh, I think that is uh, a nice way of fabricating their nest. If they are using the circular leaf, they need many and they can't even um, stack the leaf if they are using circular leaf. So they basically use a long leaf, I mean the long fragments uh, they bring in um, so they can make a wall of their nest. So they're not exactly circular leaf. They basically are oblong leaf. Um, uh, I think that is the reason why they are uh, using the oblong leaf rather than the circular leaf. So basically, they are not using the circular leaf. There's a question from Axel Brockman. Axel? Yeah, Axel. Okay, you can hear me. Yeah? Hi, Sino. Hi, um, Axel. I can I'm hear you. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm kind of, um, my hair is not done. So I'm, I'm not. So it, my question uh, was, 
So you said that um, the bees are revisiting the leaves they already kind of cut. And I was yes. wondering whether you might have the hypothesis that cutting leads to um, the initiation of the plant's defense. And that actually, so um, they're transporting then antimicrobial um, substances mm -hmm. to the leaves, for example, and that could be beneficial for the nests of the leaf cutter bees. Mm, yes, it's again a good hypothesis to test. Um, uh, uh, there are some discussions with plant scientists over here um, on that. Um, so they are telling, yes, when there is a herbivory, the plant will be pumping uh, the defensive chemicals to the leaf. Um, so we can be, but the first leaf is again, which is undamaged leaf. Um, my my way of thought is that of course the leaf uh, because of uh, uh, because of uh, herbivory uh, there may be anti defense or defensive uh, molecules may be coming to that particular leaf that may be there but uh, the second reason may be once if once the bee recognizes its leaf uh, they don't want to you know search for other leaf uh, uh, good, good leaf uh, they may be uh, marking that leaf by their labial or mandibular gland uh, uh, secretions. So, so that may be the reason why they are recognizing their old leaf. But yes, uh, the, that uh, uh, plant uh, uh, may be uh, increasing or the pumping their antimicrobial or wound healing chemicals into the leaf. It could be another reason. So again, again, a hypothesis uh, uh, testing here. Yeah, thanks, Axel. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, there's a question on our YouTube channel. Avinash Chauhan would like to know whether uh, leaf cutter bees are selective and for their um, in selecting flora for nesting and for sustenance. And do we know anything about the different mechanisms by which they select for nesting and for sustenance. So I, I suppose he means flowers versus leaves. Huh. Uh, so what the little what we know, uh, the bees have, uh, the leaf cutter bees have preference for the same group of plant for foraging pollen nectar as well as foraging leaf. Um, if that is a question, you know, is the nest nesting, uh, I, I can say that yes, they have uh, a selection of uh, plants based on uh, their trait. The trait, what I refer here is their taxonomic affinity. Um, uh, so there might be a reason why the fabels or ocels are coming together. Um, uh, the taxonomy is so why they are bringing all those plants in the same cluster. Bees may be using that uh, 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 trait for foraging bees. But if your question is on nesting substrate, we don't have any information. We don't have any studies telling this is the best places where they are um, where they are um, uh, constructing their nest. No, they, they can be anywhere. As I mentioned, this was nesting uh, in the uh, in the chain pipe of uh, my son's cycle, uh, a laterate rock uh, very close to the rose flower. Um, all these uh, nesting places are very, very different from one after another. So, uh, but some of them are very exposed to the sun. Some of, most of them, actually, most of them were exposed to the sun. Uh, uh, some of them are in the hiding places. So, yes, they have selection of the plants uh, for cutting the leaf, but they, I don't know whether there is any selection of nesting places uh, not studied well. So, uh, Sinu, I think the question was, from what I can understand, the question was, how do they select flora, which means, uh, you know, plant parts for nesting and for sustenance, which probably is for nectar and pollen? Uh, it's not really clear to me. What, what do you mean by the uh, fl nesting on the flora itself? No, no. It means, I think, how do they choose uh, which plants should they cut the leaves from to build ne uh, for their nest, to line their you nest, mean, and how mean, do they choose plants for visiting flowers? Uh, 
uh, as I mentioned, uh, they, they like uh, Fabesian or papillonaceous uh, flowers, uh, preferably, because they need a lower keel for uh, sitting as well as uh, carrying the pollen. Um, um, the first part of the question is uh, still not clear to me. How do they select uh, uh, the leaf or the plant? As I mentioned, the taxonomic membership of the plant is uh, one reason. The size of the node size, the, uh, the, the, the nature of the leaf, like the glossiness, the glabrous, non-resin leaf, uh, these are all the one preferred. Less, less, less water content leaf because the, this water should not be a problem for uh, the mold to come in. Rather, the leaf should dry quickly inside their nest. So I think that the criteria they prefer, one is taxonomic membership. That's what I strongly feel because on the phylogenetic tree, there is a good number of plants uh, on similar plants. The other traits like uh, they don't have any uh, preference to trees over herbs. They have, they are going to the herbs, they are going to shrubs, they are going to lianas, they're going to the vines, they're going to climbers, provided their leaves are uh, good enough to manage. So as uh, Viresh mentioned, you know, some of them don't have the good mandibular blade to cut through that um, um, the midrib of the leaf or the leaf, non-midrib part of the leaf. So, uh, so the glossy leaves, tender leaf, less water content leaf, that kind of plants they prefer. Uh, only very few cases we have seen they are nesting on the plants. So for example, rose cane. Uh, the reason why the people advise uh, to remove the leaf cutter be because they are not only taking the leaf, they are even using the canes of uh, uh, rose uh, to nest. Uh, so that's why they find it could be a threat for the rose plants. Okay. Thank you, Sino. Uh, there's a question from Smita. Yes, Smita. Smita, I can't hear you. Hi. Smita? Hi, yeah. Hi. Um, very nice talk, very interesting. Um, Thank you. Uh, the, yeah, the only uh, question I had was, uh, did you ever try reed bamboo or plandra as trap nests? Did I ever what? Try reed bamboo or clandra as trapness? Um, uh, uh, I used, but they never occupied. Um, okay. See, see let, let me tell you their holes, uh, mouth not necessarily to be that big. As I mentioned, the rose uh, cane, you can imagine what is the size of a rose cane. Um, even that is uh, used to um, a nest. Um, so the, the, the diameter of the rose cane is uh, not the, that uh, wide, uh, even that is used, that is uh, used for nesting. Um, um, this agave, agave plants in Arizona, um, which is something like our cane plants, they used, but not the whole material, but they used the pit part of it, um, the dead part of that agaves. Uh, they they use to build the nest, not the live part of it, not even the hollow material of these bamboos or canes. But yes, they 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 can be also used, uh, um, uh, provided their width is uh, small. If their width is big, they may need more number of leaf to make. They may not be needing that because the cycle thing. What I said, they were all loosely. Uh, only one side is attached uh, to the, the tube. It is not occupying the whole um, area to, to make the nest. So um, it to be explored, uh, Smitha. But none yeah. of my my trap nest with the uh, these canes were occupied. That is another we, another. We tried, we tried some, and in fact, we had quite good occupancy. Um, I would say quite some mega kylids, uh, but. I think majority were uh, crab wasps. nesting wasps, but we yeah. also had a good number of uh, mega kylids. They are yet to be identified. Probably, I should send it to you guys. Yeah, please. Yeah, would love to. Know. See, the advantage of Bangalore, uh, the zone is an arid region. We have a very humid zone, as you know, the Kerala, raining in raining a very un unpredictable climate over here. 
So uh, normally they don't uh, prefer this uh, uh, plant or pits of the plant for uh, nesting. They basically go to um, uh, non planty or you know artificial things or other. Uh, is 10, 15 nest, I could explore the wild uh, nest, which are all on this PVC tubes or this rails on the roof um, um, where this thatch um, on there, um, but never on the plants, never on, never on the plants. Yeah, okay. so good observation, Thanks. Smitha. Thank you. Smitha, was, uh, you had success with Oclandra, is it? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have some more questions. Deborah, Deborah Smith. Oh, hello. Hello. Um, how are you? That was a wonderful talk. That that was very interesting. And I was just wondering. I've seen leaf cutter bees taking uh, cuts from the blossoms of large flowers like uh, lilies, and I was wondering if you've seen that. And that would seem to bring so much moisture into the nest if they were using the the soft petal tissue. Uh, Deborah, it's so nice to uh, uh, hear that. We have seen, yes, uh, hibiscus flowers in tropics, uh, very close to my house, hibiscus flower petals they used. Bougainvillea flowers, of course, they are not really flowers. Um, colored leaves, um, um, they are using extensively um, uh, for. Uh, I really don't know what really happens to that uh, flower petals once in, in, inside the nest. I don't know where from you are, which part of uh, America you are. Um, suppose if it is in a dry zone, even the flower petal will be quickly drying. Say, for example, in yeah. Tucson, Tucson, they're bringing these uh, leaves to uh, very sun exposed places. And I can imagine within hours, the leaf would have been dried. So, yeah, well, actually, I saw this in uh, Bangalore when I was visiting. So it was a a local uh -huh. Indian species, not 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 our not our species here. So, uh huh, yeah. So, but we we really don't know what's really happening mm -hmm. to that uh, flower petals inside the nest, and what kind of nest they are using. What is the environment of that nest? If the nest is an exposed area, I think the petals may be quickly drying up. Uh, mm -hmm. Even the hibiscus uh, petals, what I find, you know, they are they are dried up quickly, even though they have pretty good amount of uh, water in it. Yeah, that's a good observation anyway. Thank you. There's a question from Belawadi. Belawadi, there's a question. You, you want to ask yeah. something? Uh, so, you know, uh, this is only an extension of the question that was asked by, I think, Avinash Chawan. Uh, what is the probability of a bee using the same plant for both leaves and also forage? It's again uh, what we are doing here in Arizona. I see uh, 40 percentage of the plants of the fabes they used both flower as well as uh, uh, the leaf. But let me tell you, um, some flower, some plants, say for example, punica uh, granita, that is our pomegranate leaf, a pomegranate plant. Uh, they, they do go to their flowers and also they use the leaf. But yes. what I've seen there, what I've seen there, their, their phenology of leaf flushing is entirely different from the phenology of the flowering time. So when they are, when they are flushing leaves, they go to the, flower, the leaves, but uh, when they're flowering, the, uh, the leaves are quite old. So they're not really giving a very big pressure to the plant I, I got the point that it may not be giving a very big uh, herbivory pressure to that uh, uh, plant. A again, this, that's what I said in the last slide. There are several testable hypotheses uh, related to this herbivory that can be asked uh, with uh, this um, leaf cutter bee and the leaf uh, uh, relationship. So we are doing that with the rose now. We are seeing you know, whether the number of birds uh, in uh, netted, netted plants uh, is more than that which are exposed to this base. But as you know, it is very difficult to come up with a, a, a experiment like this. It's not necessarily that the bees will come, in, come to that leaf and foraging. So we have started that kind of experiments about to go, where to go. But yes, they do go to the same plant for foraging, both the flower 
uh, matter as well as the leaf matter. But luckily, the plants have different phenological events happening. Thank you. Thank you. Hema, I can't hear you. Is there any question? Yes, more? Um, can you uh, hear me? There's a question yes. from Kavya. There's a question from Kavya. Yeah, Kavya. Kavya? Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay. <laughs> That's again some, yeah, great. yes, great again. That's again what we are doing. So, for example, our uh, uh, cashew fistula is a most, most uh, uh, wanted plant. Um, uh, you know that uh, cabbage butterfly, um, the yellow, um, uh, what is that? Um, um, oh, I forgot. There's a couple of butterfly species are using. Leaf cutter bees also coming to that. Yes, there is a competition really happening for the for the forage matter. Yes, there. But what we see, um, um, uh, butterflies uh, uh, don't mind if there is any small damage there. But leaf cutter bees never go to a leaf which has other herbivory damage. But butterflies, I have seen, they are even um, laying their eggs uh, on uh, on this uh, leaf cutter. A bee uh, cut leaf. But let me tell you again, um, uh, this other herbivores even uh, eat mature leaf. But leaf cutter bees will be preferring only this uh, um, young leaf. But yes, yes, this is, uh, this is what we have seen. Leaf cutter bees uh, have a problem if the leaf is a uh, damaged. What we are doing now, we are clipping the leaves to see whether uh, the leaves have been preferred. They don't come. They don't come. We are doing that with a uh, uh, manually we are clipping, but they are not coming. But butterflies, they, they do come and they lay eggs on that because the larvae are going to other leaves and eating. But leaf cutter bees are using only one leaf, so they don't. Yeah, good question again. Thanks. Uh, there's a question on the YouTube channel. Uh, Shankar Bhatt wants to know whether you have observed in any given nest leaf bits from different plant species mm -hmm. in no 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 the thing is uh, we, we we did not uh, we did not see um, one brood cell as a different leaf uh, a different uh, originating from different plant species um, but yes the bee is using multiple plant species um, different species different individuals yes but what we have seen uh, again, to be studied with extensive number. Uh, with a limited number, I have seen the leaves of the same species used for one brood cell. Uh, so they are not really mixing. They are not really mixing. Okay. Uh, there's a question from uh, Joby, Joby Joseph. Uh, he wants to know whether the leaf nest is sort of hair type. Nest after, is what? After it is sealed for a game, is it airtight? Uh, uh, Hema, I'm sorry, I, there was some disturbance. Is the nest after sealing what? Is the nest after uh, after egg laying and sealing, is it airtight? Airtight? No, I did not. I did not study whether they are airtight. Uh, the brood brood chamber no, may not be may not be, and the tube also not airtight. Uh, I don't think, I don't think, no, not possible. Okay, okay. Um, well, let me just check if there are other questions. Um, so, is it, there's another question which asks, uh, you have surveyed and found a number of plants being visited by uh, No. Is it possible that the different curvature size gives a clue of the different 
leaf cutter species. It will use the curvature size to determine species. Uh, Hema, there was some disturbance, but I got the question from mm -hmm. this. If the bee has any specific uh, leaf fragment size, no, no. As you have seen in the uh, that next uh, picture, I have shown the piece, uh, pieces of oblong leaf. I have also shown the leaves of a very, very tiny circular leaf. And also, some cases, they even use a very big leaf to ensheath the whole brood chamber. So after this, they made the whole, they are using a large piece of leaf. So again, I have shown that the cashew fistula flower, you can see the largest uh, uh, leaf fragment to the smallest, all cut by the same species of bee and the same individual of the bee. So there is no specificity, actually, between uh, bee species and the size of the cut. Again, from my garden here in my house, I have visual, I have, I have experienced um, the bee is uh, using the same leaf for different shapes of uh, um, fragments. Yeah, again, these are all to be tested, yeah. So I have a question. Uh, Sinu, yeah. has anyone looked at the diversity of uh, uh, pollen grains that they, uh, you know, bring back and store as bread, bee bread? They, they are uh, uh, coming from the uh, same species, most of the cases, uh, mm -hmm. or are uh, belonging to the Fabiaceans. Uh, whatever I have, I don't, I don't really study that uh, in good number. Maybe uh, Belvadik or Viresh can explore, uh, tell more about it. But I have seen Fabiacean pollens, uh, very less mixing of uh, pollen grains. Uh, there's another project what I'm doing, the flower constancy, uh, not including that. Megachiles, uh, they have a very uh, good um, um, range of uh, flower fidelity I have seen. Uh, but I think they are mixing pollen grains from different Fabiacean species. But in the field, what I have seen, uh, their, their flower fidelity is a pretty, pretty, pretty good. Yeah. But uh, everybody can tell more about it. Or Pradeepa, if he is there, I think I have seen one article from Pradeepa um, on this. Or Viresh can tell more about it. Yeah, I think uh, Viresh has a question. Uh, right? Yes, you know. No, no, uh, just to add this. Um, yes, Pradeepa has studied uh, under Belavadi, sir. So he has recorded, uh, he has studied more than 370 samples of pollen grains, uh, I mean, the nest pollens. And uh, uh, he observed that more than 95% of the food uh, uh, which provided to the brood is from Fabaceae plants. Yeah. So majority of the uh, pollen belongs to the Fabaceae plants. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. So there, there is a paper on floral preference for pollen by leaf cutter bees in Bangalore, India. Yeah, I have seen that. That's what I yeah. refer. Oh. Yep. Yes. Okay. Again, okay. to be studied, um, Hema. If the project yeah. comes through, yes, <laughs> we will collaborate. The project has come through. The money has come through. through only yeah. the money. It doesn't matter if money is coming or not. There is yeah. still possibility for a collaboration. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. 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 Great. Uh, there okay. is a question from Suchitra, Suchitra, Suchitra Kumar. Uh -huh. Dr. Suchitra. I Dr. can't Suchitra? hear it. Can you unmute your mic, please? Yes, ma'am. Is it audible, ma'am? Yes. 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 Please, yes. Uh, sir, it was a very good presentation. Thank you. Sir, uh, I have a very basic question. Uh, I want to know how far is the nest located from the source? That means from the damaged plants. Is that measured or is that studied? Yes, see, there are many things uh, I did not really include because this is uh, organizers are going to put this in the web. Almost all these things have been studied, but I could not publish that. They're all in the process. Um, the flower foraging plants are very, very far, but uh, leaf foraging plants are very close to their nest. Um, the reason I, I think, again, to be tested, you know, the reason I think the leaf is a pretty heavier than the pollen they are carrying. So the nest, what I have seen uh, is like eight to 15 meters, uh, not even eight to, it is like 50 centimeters to 
15, 15 meters. So that's what uh, my study in Kerala uh, and also in Arizona. Uh, this is what I have seen. 50 centimeter to uh, 15 meters. So that's what I, I could measure. Yeah, again, okay. good point to be studied. Sir, uh, in continuation of that one, in that case, what do they use uh, to identify their nest? Because they collect each and every bit and then they go to their nest and uh, build up their nest. No idea, Sujitra. I have no idea how they how how do they really prefer one nesting place for nesting. So maybe they are looking the 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 circumference or the that uh, uh, you know that uh, uh, diameter of that. Uh, not necessary. See, this uh, rose skin has a very very small diameter, uh, but uh, the cycle tube what I have saw, shown is the diameter is like uh, uh, three four centimeter. So the raw skin, what I have seen, has a diameter of like um, 1.2 centimeter. Um, the laterite brick I have seen is something like less than a centimeter. That is the nest hole mouth size. I don't know what, what exactly uh, uh, it, when you excavate through, what will be the size of the tube. It again to be studied, but uh, no idea uh, what they're really looking at. That is what, you know, that is one of the problems also, improving the nesting services. Um, the people have found with the trap nest, but I don't recommend. The reason is um, they, they may occupy, but again, the brood mortality is pretty high. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you. Sinod with a question from the YouTube channel. So Nirmal Raj would like to know, what are the, who are the predators of leaf cutter bees? Hmm. Yeah, so there are uh, um, our, uh, um, uh, not exactly the predator, but the parasitic uh, bees from the same family like the celiosis are there. There are uh, beetles are coming, ants coming. Uh, there are, uh, I forgot one, which uh, uh, directly go in, um, um, what is that? Robber, robber, robber flies coming. Um, uh, for the adult um, uh, uh, ones. Um, for the larvae, basically more than the uh, predators, parasitoids are the threats. Uh, there are braconids, uh, there are eulophids, uh, they, are, they are using that flesh, the flesh of that larvae and egg, egg parasitism. Okay. okay. So I think uh, we will have to stop, though there are lots of questions, but I think we've taken all, almost all the questions. There were some duplicate questions, which I sort of skipped. So thank you very much, uh, Sino. That was a brilliant talk, very informative. You're, you are the leaf cutter bee man. So yeah, thanks a lot. And um, we have been, I mean, you've been actively participating in the, in the seminar series. And so we hope to see you again in the weeks to come. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so Emma. much. Thank you, Emma. Thank you all thank for the patient listening. You. Yeah, please thank do you. write to me if there are any more questions or want collaborations, etc. There's a good team coming up. Thank you a lot. Yeah. Thank you. And we hope thank to see you all Thank you, sir. Nice yes. to see you. Yes. Good thank night. You and hope to see you, see everybody next week, next Friday. Thank yes. you all. Bye. Who is speaking, uh, Hema? Next Friday, we have... Um, uh, I, okay, I have the schedule here. Next Friday, we have Deborah 